Welcome. Earth along with me. Oh, gnarly. Oh, my God, I shot my eye out. These guys are 11. Reading Starfighter. Hasta la vista, baby. What's going on? 14. Yeah, hello everybody and welcome to 40 Going On 14. I am Mike. I am Patrick. I'm Joel. And I'm Josh. And this week we're going to be talking about War of the Worlds, which uh, almost 85 years ago was a radio broadcast that shows just how much times have changed because uh, the radio broadcast apparently made some people freak out because they thought aliens were invading. If that happened today, everyone would just be like, yeah, that fucking tracks. Pretty much. An yeah, alien invasion would, would complete my bingo card. <laughs> going for the full sweep, huh? <laughs> yes, this week we are going with War of the Worlds, the original 1953 up against the Tom Cruise 2005. There's been lots of remakes of it, but uh, those are most well known. Including some TV shows. Yeah. It's a very popular story that's been being told many times. Yeah, it's uh, apparently the since it's based on the H.G. Wells novel, it, it's got the distinction of being the most commented on and adapted science fiction story of all time. That's kind of crazy. I mean, it tracks, but it's kind of crazy too. You know, the only, but with only other thing. I well, would think Alien be... Invasion from Mars has always been kind of like the number one pinnacle of sci-fi mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's kind of its birth really Alien yeah in, and th- yeah this is kind of the around. prototype for all those others yeah so there you go if you'd like to get in touch with us and give us a show idea you'd like to hear you can give us a call at 708 now wrap that's 708-669-9727 you can also click and join uh, our discord by clicking the join us link in the show notes and this week we have a uh, growing New Zealand contingent. Yeah, we have some new members, don't we? Just this morning we had um Steve-O, Steve-O, the, Steve-O. our newest newest from New Zealand. Yeah. Well, welcome to to the show Steve-O, Steve-O. Unfortunately, we have no feedback. Got no voicemails, got no emails. Which means once more into the archive for a question of the week. Yep. Ooh, questions. Yeah, so this week, the question of the week is, what do you find overrated but other people like? Patrick is going to be excluded from this one because his answer is everything. I was just going to say life. <laughs> what do I find overrated? Most everything. Really. But yeah. other yeah. people like. Uh, yeah, hmm. that's that's the contingent there. See, I got a lot of answers to this. I know. I mean, I, you it, you kind of almost kind of have to narrow it down into genres like TV shows. For me, it's The Office. I think it's only because you won't give it the full chance. If I have to watch an entire season to get the momentum going on a TV show, it's a bad TV show. I disagree. Also, it's also a standard TV show. That's kind of, I mean, it's it's the it's the odd TV show that starts off with a bang and goes, you know, full full court from the beginning. Usually, yeah. it's movies that go that route, but TV yeah. shows are the opposite. A lot of shows, yeah, have a kind of tepid first season that really hits its stride at the beginning of season two. I mean, even Seinfeld has a weak first season. That see, that's another one that I think is overrated. You are way wrong on that. <laughs> well, you keep thinking well, that. Well, it way. is a good answer to the question, though. It's yeah, that's true. He thinks is yeah. overrated yeah. that other people like. Correct. Yeah, it, it, definitely. Um, I had an answer. Now I forgot it. Shit. I say Doctor Who. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's all right if you feel that way. No, I, no, I don't really feel that way. I don't really have much of an opinion on it. <laughs> I just wanted to say that to mess with you. It's one of the things that Patrick doesn't have an opinion about. (laughs) Right? Yeah. Like, people think I hate on things. I, 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 nothing things more than anything. What, Josh? I want to go hard left 
even though this isn't a, as universal an answer, but like people who are from or who have been to Chicago, uh, what I'm going to say is uh, overrated that other people like, even though I kind of like it, but I think it's incredibly overrated is Portillo's. A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, I enjoy it, but there are some people that are kind of fanatical about it and I don't think it's to that level. Chick-fil-A no, I... down here is would be my answer if I'm going to go with food. Well, every place has their overrated food place. Right. Well, and Chick-fil-A is kind of everywhere. Yeah, we got them all over up here now. Yeah. Nowadays. I, I mean, people people will wait like an hour in line down here. And I'm like, no, thank you. Woof. It's not hmm. that good. Hmm. I mean, that's how it is when we get a new restaurant in town. But that that's short term, you know. But that's also your town. I mean, I, I live in a city of 150,000 people, so yeah, it's not huge, but it's not a cow town either. Uh, right. We have more shootings per capita than many other towns. And a lot of corn. I mean, there's some corn. That's something else I think. Corn. It doesn't shoot, though. Screw corn. <laughs> the band or the food? Both. Both. No. <laughs> Screw corn with corn. Ew. Don't Google that. <laughs> you get cream corn if you do that. Oh. <laughs> also a good answer to the question. Cream corn is overrated. Oh. No. <laughs> I, I thought somebody cream corn. was going to say Big Bang Theory for sure, but... I was waiting it. for it. Too obvious. I, we I haven't seen enough to really say, so... Um. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I kind of like it, but I don't like love it to the point where some people get fanatical about it. And, it, and maybe it's just I'm not it's not my fandom, but like Harry Potter, for example, I think it's all right. It's fun. I enjoy it, but I don't think it's like the be all end all. I don't know if that really qualifies because I do enjoy it. Fireworks. Oh, I fucking hate that would fireworks. be my answer. Yeah, it's a good answer. A lot of people like them. Uh, I think a lot of dog owners who have gotten past their teenage and early 20s have the same opinion you and I and Joel do about them. Oh, I hate them. I hate them I, so much. I love them, but I just love blowing shit up. I mean, it right? could be, I would it could much be an oil barrel. Down than blow up a firework. Yeah. Right. You know what I've always wanted to do in lieu of fireworks is that um, just the thing where they, they put like the propane gas underneath the barrels and lit the barrels up and they shot like 40 feet in the air. Oh, that sounds fun. Yeah. It was like oil barrels too. It wasn't like... What? Yeah. You've never seen that video. What? That's much more fun than fireworks. Yeah. What in the redneck hell are you talking about? Exactly. Huh. Well, I don't know. I th think we've kind of milked this question. That sounds dangerous. But fun. Is it about that time? Sure. Not, I think uh, so. This week in music, movies, and TV. It's sports. It's sports. Did you want to try again, sir? It's sports. There you go. Sports. Yeah, there we go. It's better. Sports. <laughs> sports. Sports. So August 13th, 1953, the release of the World of the War World of the Wars. The World of the Wars crap. <laughs> you know, you know what it is? Is you put the acronym there and it says T W O T W and my brain started saying World of Warcraft. <laughs> the release of the war the war of the world of Warcraft World War. House House. On Hill House House Hill. <laughs> All right. Well, music. The number one song in the land was Via Con Dios, May God Be With You by Les Paul and Mary Ford. I probably know that song. You know that song. Is that the one where he's like, Via Con Dios, my darling? Or is that a different song? You, are you seriously asking if the song Via Con Dios is the one where they sing Via Con Dios? <laughs> is, is that what's happening here? Uh, no, it's not actually. But <laughs> Mike asked if he if he knew the song, and I'm like, he knows that song. Does anybody know how the song "Help" goes? I need somebody, somebody to help. Anybody? Figure, figure out how that song goes. Yeah. Yeah. Help. All right, moving on. 
Kevin Rowland, born August 17th, is a British singer-songwriter of Irish descent, primarily known for being the frontman for Dexys Midnight Runners. Currently called Dexys, they had several hits in the early 1980s. The most notable song, Come On Eileen, which reached number one on the UK singles chart. Did it not chart that high here in the States? I'm sure it did, but it didn't reach one. So That really? makes sense. I mean, there was a lot of competition at that time. At that time. Come on, Eileen. Well, I mean, I I feel like it's more popular probably than it is. I don't know why. Was that in a movie or something? I think I'm it became to popular later more than so than it was when it was released. Hmm. It hit. Was it in a movie or something? What is it? It hit a one in Australia, Belgium, Ireland, strangely, New Zealand, South Africa, Switzerland. UK singles, U- U.S. Oh. Billboard Hot 100. Yeah, Hit yeah, one. did it reach one. Wow. Yeah. So, Interesting. Okay. I just, I yeah, feel like it became much more popular within the past, like I don't know, twenty, thirty years. Uh, was it on the Wedding Singer? No. Yeah, I'm looking it up I right think, now. I think the Wedding Singer was set before this would have come out. Huh. Anyway. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, interesting. It, it just it seemed to have popped up recently. Anyway, there you go. Uh, James J.T. Warren Taylor, born August 16th, is a singer who achieved worldwide fame as a lead singer of Cool and the Gang. His tenure as lead singer was the most successful era in the band's history with the albums Ladies' Night, Celebrate, and Emergency, which included hit singles Ladies' Night, Joanna, Celebration, Get Down on It, and Cherish. Taylor left the group in 1989 to begin a solo career, but is reunited with the band a few times in concerts and recorded one last album with them in 1996. And when I first started this segment, I thought we were going to talk about James Taylor. And I was going to say, there's somebody that I think is overrated, (laughs) but people seem to like. Well, and I couldn't have told you the name of the lead singer of Cool and the Gang, but like all of those singles are pretty good. Yeah, you definitely know it's Cool and the Gang. Yes. (laughs) I mean, Cherish is crap, but other than that, they're good songs. <laughs> cherish is the word I No, that's not, that's not that one. Cherish the thought. I think. No. No? No. There's a lot of songs with Cherish. Yeah. Cherish the... the, the ba doo doo slap <laughs> dee doo It's that one. That one. <laughs> cherish the doo doo slap a dee doo Man, I'm up next, and I don't know Cherish from Cool and the Gang. I, I thought it. I'm, I'm trying to remember Joanna. I know it, but I, I'm not going to sing it because it's just such a bad song. And it's like, it's just, I don't want okay, to Okay, yeah, I don't head. know the song. Oh. All right. Well, yeah, we'll it, move on then. It's it's Man. like a, they're on a beach during the whole video. It's just a horrible song. It's just really bad. Very, schmal- very schmaltzy. All right, moving on to movies. The top movie in the land was. From here to eternity. It's this episode. Dude. What? We got that great uh, seaweed washing up over them scene from that one. I don't think I've ever seen that. I don't think I have either. Really? That scene is classic. Oh, yeah. And great movie. Parodied many, many, many times over. Mm-hmm. Other movies released this week were Hans Christian Andersen. And Roman Holiday. Oh, yeah. Roman Holiday was excellent. Roman Holiday is good stuff. So there you go. That's movies. Uh, There were no Nielsen ratings, so we don't know. Cosby Show and Gunsmoke. But I'm picking up 1953 in television series that were on the air. So it could have been something along these lines. So The Adventures of Superman, American Bandstand. Ah, yeah. Death Valley Days, Dragnet, ah. Gillette Cavalcade of Sports, <laughs> Muffin the Mule, uh, which ran from 1946 to 1955. That's kind of Muffin, weird. get in here. <laughs> no, that's that's my euphemism for jerking off. Muffin the Mule. <laughs> what are you doing over there? I'm just Muffin the Mule. Cherish the patootie, the patootie. <laughs> Holy cats. 
those some TV shows that debuted this year, Romper Room. <gasps> Whoa. Yeah. Wow, I didn't realize it was that old. Huh. Yeah, so there you go. Also, on August 15th, The Tonight Show began its long and historical journey as a local New York variety show originally titled The Knickerbocker Beer Show. Do, 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 do. On August 18th, Judge for Yourself with Fred Allen also debuted. Hmm. I don't know that, that one. It, it's like a show where they would have people come in for their court trials, and instead of going to an actual judge, they'd have, you know, like a celebrity panel. And they'd say, judge for yourself. And then they would tell them whether or not they were guilty and they'd sentence them. Do you guys remember that show? I'm not entirely sure you're telling the truth. Cherish the doop a doo doop a doo doo Okay, so Catherine Lee Gifford, born August 16th, is a French born American television presenter, singer, songwriter, actress, and author. She's best known for her 15 year run on the talk show she co hosted with Regis Philbin, the acronym of the week, which is, oh my God, L W R A K L. Pretty sure that stands for listen, we really appreciate Kenny Loggins. <laughs> Ew. Uh, with all those hints, you still couldn't get it. No, that uh, is live with Regis and Kathy Lee. I want to see Regis Philbin sing Danger Zone. Nobody <laughs> appreciates Messina. Did I say it's... Messina? No, but I'm saying <laughs> nobody appreciates Messina. And they You're should. not wrong. He's going to do an album with Oats. So she's also known for her 11-year run with Hoda Kotib. On the fourth hour of NBC's Today Show, she has received 11 Daytime Emmy nominations and won one. Kathy Lee has reduced studio music albums and several books. One of the songs, which will be sung by Joel. Messina and Oates featuring Cherish. <laughs> Cherish. Also, born August 8th, Don Moss is an actor and singer best known for his role as Ralph Malf on the television series Happy Days. Except it's most, but not most. Not Don Moss. Most. Most? Most. Oh. Most. Eh. Mo- mo- I most went folks. for it and lost. <laughs> well, it sounded like you said Moss. I'm like, he's definitely not Moss. Don <laughs> Moss. He's everywhere. You want to be only on the north side of every tree. <laughs> All right, Boy Scout. That was me. All right, moving on to sports. Born sports. August 8th, Louis Sweet Lou Dunbar is one of the most important figures in the history of the Harlem Globetrotters. He currently serves as, as the director of player personnel, but he's also been the coach both after a 27 year career as the point guard for the Harlem Globetrotters. So if you've ever seen the Harlem Globetrotters, chances are you saw Sweet Lou. I did, actually. I did see yep. them once. Me no too. joke. Me cool. Too. We're Eskimo brothers. <laughs> We're Globetrotter brothers. Well, actually, well, you know what? Never mind. We're not going down this road. <laughs> I'm, All right. I'm not sure what this means going. anymore. Keep driving. Come on. Let's go. <laughs> Terry okay. Eugene Bollea, born August 11th, is better known by his ring name, Hulk Hogan. A retired professional wrestler and television personality, he is widely regarded as the most recognized wrestling star worldwide. Hogan gained worldwide recognition after signing with the WWF, now WWE, in 1983. There, his persona as a heroic All-American helped usher in the 1980s professional wrestling boom, where he headlined eight of the first nine WrestleMania events. During his initial run, he won the WWF Championship five times, with his first reign being the second longest in the championship's history. He is the first wrestler to win consecutive Royal Rumble matches. Hogan also performed for the WCW, AWA, NJPW, and TNA, now known as Impact Wrestling. During and after wrestling, Hogan had an extensive acting career, beginning with his 1982 cameo role in Rocky III, where he starred as Thunderlips. He has starred in several films, including No Holds Barred, Suburban Commando, and Mr. Nanny, and three television shows, Hogan Knows Best, Thunder in Paradise, and China, Illinois. Okay, so before you move on, Patrick, would you... Oh, that was the end of it. Never mind. Uh, would you say that he is 
widely regarded as the most recognized star worldwide? I mean, do you think that's accurate? Um, yeah, he's he's recognized as you know one of the biggest stars. He's not ne- recognized by anybody that knows wrestling as one of the best wrestlers by any stretch. Oh no, I mean his signature move is the leg drop and the big elbow. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, like, he, te- technically elbow? he's not he's not a, a great wrestler, but I mean he was amazing. You know, in in the in the merchandising and the promotions and on the mic, which are you know in a lot of ways, just as important as being good in the ring. He's perfect proof that you can not be one of the best in the ring and still be considered one of the top 10. Hogan has a lot of, uh, in his Charisma. career and his, his, in his everything, he has a lot of problems, <laughs> but he, there's no denying his impact on the sport. Cause I was just trying to think of anybody else that kind of even came close to that because I know like as a kid growing up in the eighties, with wrestling at one of its high points before recent, uh, uh, The he... Rock was 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 incredibly popular, and Steve Austin was possibly more popular at the height of the wrestling's you know popularity in the nineties. What about Sting? No, no, no he's no, not in the no, conversation. No. Like John Cena, maybe he's in the conversation. John Cena mainly mainly for his stamina and just his ability to stay on top for as long as he has. Undertaker. Undertaker is widely regarded as probably the number one wrestler of all time. Yeah. Like wrestler or just like noticeable? Just in general, like, like everything that he's done from beginning to the end of his career, he's been basically no doubt in the top three, you know, almost every year of his career. And just hmm. his, his record, his accolades, his ability, the respect he's earned, and just his everything he did for the sport, Undertaker is probably the number one guy. Yeah, that's the thing is like you can't find one wrestler that says really anything bad about him. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, Undertaker is one of the that. most respected, like, you know, by fans and wrestlers alike. Because when they, just when they said that comment, it got my mind thinking. I'm like, I know Hulk Hogan, but I feel like there's some other people that <clears throat> have either surpassed him or. And, and the thing about Hogan is like Hogan is way more revered among the fans than he is among the wrestlers themselves. Like there's a huge discrepancy between the amount of respect Hogan gets from the wrestlers versus he is not respected hardly at all by other wrestlers. Uh, well, Jim, Jim Cornette, one of the most famous uh, wrestling commentators of all time, said, um, and this is this has been widely proven to kind of be you know, kind, kind of kind of be a factual statement even though it's hyperbole. He says. So you have never heard every lie that Hulk Hogan has ever spoken if you haven't heard every word that Hulk Hogan has ever said. Thanks. Yeah. What, Josh? He's well, well known as a bullshitter. And he he kind of was in the news for a negative thing when he uh, had his uh, sex tape uh, leaked without his consent and uh, talked about his uh, encounters with his best friend's wife Yeah, on, on tape. And he said some racist shit. And he's been caught saying racist shit. So he's not, he's not, he's not very well respected. But he, you know, his his body of work in wrestling cannot be denied. But I gotcha. Okay, that's fair. <clears throat> I just it felt like something that there was more to it, and I wanted to just kind of brush over it before we moved on. Okay, cool. Like if he had stayed in the WWF his entire career, Vince McMahon probably would have been able to brush a lot of that shit under the rug for him and kept his name pristine. But you know, he he kind of pissed off Vince, so Vince stopped protecting him. Good job, buddy. <laughs> Jerk. Well, all right. He's waiting for you, Pat. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Play us off, keyboard Joel. <laughs> <laughs> the professionalism I respect. <laughs> Professional. All right. 1953, War of the Worlds. H.G. Wells' classic novel is brought to life in this tale of alien invasion. The residents of a small town in California are excited when a flaming meteor lands in the hills. Their joy is tempered somewhat when they discover that it has passengers who are not very friendly. Well, if your first action when you make contact with it is to hit it with a shovel, you're not very friendly either. Okay, that dude was kind of a dipshit all around. We got a sugar shack in the in the back of the truck. Let's wave it. Let them know <laughs> we're friendly. Buck. <laughs> My name's Buck. 
and I'm, and here, I'm to... here to shuck some corn. <laughs> this is the fifties, brother. And I'm here to hit things with a shovel. Yes, right. I got myself a shovel in the back, and there's sho- oh, anyway. So this is produced by Cecil B. DeMille, uncredited, Whoa. Frank Freeman Jr., and someone who's considered the say the the father Every- of. 50s sci-fi, George Powell. And everybody's I'm not your friend. buddy guy. What? We both made Make, Powell jokes. Making stupid jokes uh, about his his last name. Yeah. Because uh, okay. we're 14, you know? Well, yeah. at, least, at least you keep keep with theme. That's the okay. title. <laughs> so you got what you get. So some of the stuff that he has done in the way of directing, uh, you've got the time machine, you've got the seven faces of Dr. Lau. You've got uh, Hot Lips Jasper. I don't know what that is, but that sounds fun. Um, <laughs> it does it, though? It's, <laughs> it's the Hulahan slash Ghost crossover nobody was asking for. <laughs> but he also did Atlantis, uh, The Lost Continent, the, and The Wonderful World of the Brothers Grimm from 1962. And that was the one that had Lawrence Harvey and Claire Bloom in it. Whoa. And a very young Barbara Eden. Ooh. Got me so upset I can't talk over here. <laughs> that's Lawrence Harvey. Oh, I thought that was Barbara <laughs> Eden. <laughs> oh. I thought that's Lawrence Tierney. <laughs> oh, that is Lawrence Tierney. Yeah, thanks, Josh. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> Cherish zappa doo doo da down This is directed by Byron Haskin, who also did Robinson Crusoe on Mars, Treasure Island, and the ever-loving Man Eaters of Kuman. Robinson Crusoe on Mars. That that ties in so nicely and makes a lot of sense. If you've seen it, uh, compared to this one, it makes a lot of good companion pieces. Yeah, it's fun. It's another one of those writing, of course, based on the novel by H.G. Wells. And Barr? Barry? Barry Lyndon? Barry Lyndon, yeah. Uh, who also did the screenplay for The Greatest Show on Earth the, um, and something called The Amazing Dr. Clitterhouse, which hmm. uh, was done in 1938, movie. <laughs> 1947, and 1962. And 1969. Because nobody could find it. Oh, uh, <laughs> See what keep you looking there. for. It's like a little uh, man in a rowboat. Uh, okay, so the 1938 one, a brilliant Park Avenue doctor becomes a criminal in order to do research into the criminal mind. Starring Edward G. Robinson, Humphrey Bogart, and Claire Trevor. Oh, Edward G. Robinson, that's... And John Holmes. <laughs> it's... I don't have just... John Holmes in here. Yeah, that's... Irving something Bacon. That's something that nobody ever said. <laughs> but... Yeah, that, it's not what we thought it was. That's a shame. Mm. So starring Gene Berry as Dr. Clayton Forrester, known for War of the Worlds, and played the Bat Masterson on the TV show in 1958. Oh, okay. So that's fun. Sylvia Van Buren play, was played by Ann Robinson, who was also War of the Worlds, and also in Rocky Jones, Space Ranger. <laughs> and she was uh, wearing a wig for the uh, performance here, which apparently she hated, and it made no one able to recognize who she was. Oh, that's really, stuck. yeah. Huh? I did not notice. All right. Also, we have Les Tremaine, who we know from Shazam, the TV show, from the Shazam show that we did. That is a thing we did. Yep, Ricky Ticky Tavi. He did the voice of the father in the um, the Ricky Ticky Tavi cartoon, and he also did voices in the Kid and Play cartoon. Uh, there was a Kid and Play cartoon. What? <laughs> uh, I vaguely remember that being a thing. I don't remember if I watched more than an episode out of curiosity. Yeah, there's which such episodes as wrapped around his little finger. There's no business like Doe Business and Project Creeper Sweeper. Yeah, Kid and Play had a cartoon. I bet you they did the kick step at least once an episode. I'm sure they did. I'm I'm sure it was in the titles. Do the Kid and Play kick step. Mm -hmm. But he was also in 
uh, the fortune cookie, the Jack Lemmon and Walter Matthau movie, mm-hmm. and uh, had a, a bit part in North by Northwest. So he did real stuff too. So we also have Sandro, 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 Sandro Gigolo. Yeah, that's the way it said. Topo Gigio. So who plays <laughs> Dr. Bueller back? I had to unmute myself for this little exchange. Sandro Gigolo and Topo Gigio. What the hell's wrong with you people? <laughs> uh, he, he played Xenathon in The 300 Spartans, which is could be considered a then for 300. Yeah, sort of. Well, it's literally about the battle of, I'm going to say, Thermopylae? Thermopylae. Thermopylae. It's it's literally about that battle. So Yeah, but uh, the yeah, the movie's an adaptation of a classic graphic novel, which is why I said, yeah, kind of. Yeah. King Leonidas is played by Richard Egan, who was in Gog. I don't know what that was, but anyway, moving on. Look it up. You will be disappointed. Okay, good to know. From coming from you, that's that means something. Uh, he was also in uh, when worlds collide. Then we've got Lewis Martin, who was the um, Pastor Matthew Collins. This is pretty much all he did. This oh wait no I'm thinking of somebody else. Lewis Martin, Ace in the Hole, with uh, Kirk Douglas. He played somebody called McCardle, and he was in uh, the Court Jester. He played Sir Finsdale. Oh yeah. One of my favorite Danny Kaye movies. Then we have Housley Stevenson Jr. 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 Who is General Junior. Man's aide. He's known for... General Man for has an aide? What? General Man? Yeah. Like a little guy following around. Remember? I don't even like remember him needing to be credited, though. Like It wasn't like I saw him when I was like, who is that actor? Well... Sorry. I he just... got his name in there, you know? <laughs> he's better than you do. We also oh, have... He's dead now, so he is definitely doing better than I am. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, he's also been in something called Mean Dog Blues. Oh, no. He was the editor for that. <laughs> Actor, How to Marry a Millionaire, the TV series, Abin Costello Meet the Keystone Cops. So, got a lot of stuff going on in his career. Paul Freeze who was the radio reporter in this one, uh, in, did voices in something called The Beatniks in 1960 and did the voice of Mabrook from the 1982 The Last Unicorn. I've heard of that one, but I don't know that I've actually seen it. You haven't seen The Last Unicorn? I don't think so. Really? Huh. Yeah. Huh. I don't know if I have. I mean, really? that tracks, but I would have figured that Joel would have. Yeah. Why? Right. Some other things that he has done. He did the voice of Carr from Knight Rider. <laughs> was nice. that the enemy of Kit or something? Yeah, yep. that was mm-hmm. that was the oh, evil. Okay. Yeah. yeah. K-A-R-R. I figured, yeah, I figured it was something mm. like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, William Perry did... Um, William Phillips played Wash Perry. <laughs> Big difference. <laughs> Big difference, yeah. Uh, who was also in Cat Women on the Moon and did the voice of Prince Charming from Cinderella. Oh. Yeah, there you go. Got ourselves some Vern and Rich in here. Uh, who oh. Played Colonel Ralph Hefner. He was in uh, One Step Beyond, Outside the Law, and also in 1957 Suspicion. Hmm. Suspicion. <laughs> suspicious. Don't be suspicious. <laughs> Don't be suspicious. Henry Brandon, who did Cop at Crash Site. I just wanted to tell us because that's a great, you know, thing. Great he credit. was also in, he played Scar in the You know who I am? I played Cop at Crash Site. <laughs> <laughs> no, he also was, a, Pat, you're the John Wayne guy here, so... Remember the uh, the searchers? Have you seen that? Yeah, yeah. Okay, he played Scar. The best, the best part of the searchers is John Wayne plays a character who's supposed to be this like you know, like like he's a searcher. He finds you know he 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 finds people. You know that's his whole thing. Is like you know, oh. and like he comes out of the desert. He's supposedly been searching for someone for like six weeks, 
and he comes out of the desert and his shirt is completely pressed. He's got cu- you know perfect cuffs. His boots are like like polished up. And, yeah, I've been spending six weeks in the desert. <laughs> he's just all his hair is polished and, and just combed and polished. I'm like, okay, yeah, you look real rugged. Yeah, he brought his ner- his mate out with him. You don't know that, right? We skipped somebody. <laughs> So I got so excited about Sandro Gigolo <laughs> and Topo Gigio, I forgot Robert Cornwaith, who played Dr. Pryor, who was in The Thing from Another Planet, Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, and the TV show Picket Fences. Wow. Oh, the recent one? This fairly yeah. recent one? Oh. Fairly recent one, yeah. Yeah, who's yeah, that? For... Uh, Tom, who's... Tom, what was the guy from Picket Fences? Oh, Damn Scarrett. It. Yeah, Tom Scarrett, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Jack Crucian played Salvatore, guy who wants to start the tamale stand outside the. Uh, oh, okay, that's who yeah. that was. And uh, he was in the uh, the apartment with Jack Lemon and Shirley MacLaine. He got played Doctor Dreyfus. Yeah, this is uh, my boomstick. <laughs> and then finally, Cedric Hardwick who was a commentary on this one. He also played Sethi from the Cecil B. DeMille Ten Commandments. And Sir Fence Francis Cromarty, Cromarty, Cromarty from eight, Around the World in Eighty Days, and Mister Kentley from Alfred Hitchcock's Rope, and apparently he got knighted at some point because he's listed as Sir Cedric Hardwick in the credits. Oh yeah, yeah. I, t- I, I just as a quick aside, I'm a big fan of Cecil B. DeMille's Ten Commandments. That's a great movie. Oh yeah. I Definitely love people that played roles in that movie. Lots of people in there. Yeah. Anyway, I, I, I miss those kind of like grand, grandiose. We're going to get, we need 2,000 people for the extras. I must have killed more people than Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> All right. So, some trivia on this one. The estate of H.G. Wells was so pleased with the final production that it offered George Powell his choice of any other Wells properties. George Powell chose the time machine and did oh. that in 1960. Good choice. Yeah. Worked uh, out Mar- for him. I know, right? Time machine's another great, like 50s sci fi. I love that one. Uh, the Martian one of my War Machine. Books. Yeah. Set, time machine. One of my favorite sci fi books, Time Machine. Cool. The Martian War Machines had about 20 different wires running to each one. Some were for suspension and maneuvering, while others carried power to the various lights and mechanisms within. This was produced before there were lightweight circuits and sophisticated radio controls. I don't know. Did you guys look at any of the bat behind the scenes images? Yes. No. Those things were made out of copper. Huh. Yeah. Like, and in a lot of, uh, a lot of the actors, uh, when the stuff, because some of that stuff was done post production, wasn't all practical effects. Like it wasn't CGI, obviously, but like the actors didn't always know what they were looking at. Yeah, there were a couple times uh, in the interviews where people had said, especially um, Anne Robinson, when she saw the um, what do they call it, the, the Cobra head of the ship, and she first time it came in, she was like, "What the hell is that?" And then somebody flipped the switch and lit everything up on her, and she said, it "Scared the living crap out of her." <laughs> when everything went started going off. Yeah, like but, several of the actors that aren't in the same uh, frames as some of those things uh, just assumed that the uh, tripods were like from the book instead of being these floaty things. Mm -hmm. There was commentary that they had talked to the military a little bit about the tripods from the book. And the military was like, that would be no, the way they were described in the original book, they would be decimated by the American military, the 1950s at that point. At least that's, that's what the story, how the story goes. Huh? So one thing that this close shields they had, Okay. Yeah, like this dome, sounds, this sounds like some propaganda BS. Yeah. yeah well, uh, the domes. That well, that wasn't a thing anyway. But this this movie, I think, has the most recognizable sound effects of any sci-fi movie for Out- sure. Outside of like the, the the powering up of a lightsaber, the late the late fire beams, the heat beams off the off the tripods, and this and that whoa, 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 that noise that they make in the background. Everyone knows those noises for sure. They are the uh, like prototype of the your pew pew sounds from everything sci-fi. Mm-hmm. Now, getting into the trivia on that, 
Pew, pew. The sound effects of the Martian war machine's heat rays were created from three electric guitars played backwards. The sound of a Martian screaming after Forrester hit it with the with the well, Forrester launched that axe at him. <laughs> that was a mixture of a microphone scraping along dry ice and a woman's scream played backwards. Oh, weird. Yeah, the the former set of fa- sound effects became widely used as stock sound effects after this film was released, and they're still in use sometimes. Uh, the vibrating noise that the, the machines make is the feedback from an early version of something called an Echoplex tape mach- echo machine, which has a recording head. Basically, do you ever when you were playing uh, cassette tape and do you ever like grab the tape and pull on it, tighten it, lower it, and that sort of thing would make the tape make weird noises. Mm-hmm. It, that's what it was. So they actually had like a little lever that you can make the echo effect by playing a sound effect tape across there, and that would do that for you. And a little known fact: um, the very first time you see an alien, it was someone dressed up as Gossamer from the Bugs Bunny cartoon doing the Thriller dance. He's like, Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta admit, like this movie did a lot of good things as far as special effects for the time, but. When that first alien appeared, I I fucking lost my shit. I was like, "What the fuck?" Ah, I loved it. Yeah, I thought it was really uh for its time, really clever. That, to- that totally yeah. took me out because it really it really did to me look like Gossamer doing the thriller it, dance. It did look I like loved. Gossamer, the way he's the way it's built. But uh, last thing, and you guys thought I was nuts. I know you guys did. A figure <laughs> of Walter Lance's most popular character, Woody Woodpecker can be glimpsed in the branches of the tree of the initial Martian cylinder meteor flying over. Lance and George Pal were close friends, and George Pal always worked in an appearance of Woody Woodpecker into each of his films. That's a strange flex for them. Isn't that weird? Well, we could well, definitely couldn't make it out in the screenshot you took. But <laughs> Well, I mean, we're also, you know, I'm taking it on a cell phone camera on a pause 1953 non-HD <laughs> you know, version. But if you, if I, I wish I was able to like trace out. But apparently, it's not like there's a cardboard cutout. It looks more like like a Woody Woodpecker dog chew toy type of thing. Okay. So I've got to make a note. I have to post that picture in the show notes, otherwise people are gonna think I'm nuts. Well, and I looked it up. I, I mean, I, I you probably already did this too, but I looked it up in the just to see if he could find it somewhere, a better picture of it. And there's like screen grabs, but none of them, even on the uh, HD, you know, high quality crap are, are clear enough to really see. Weird. I know it's, it's kind of cool, but at the same time, like I said, that's a weird flex. Other thing I heard about this was uh, none of the original uh, models were preserved for posterity. They were made of copper, so they uh, got donated to the Boy Scouts. Yep, they got donated a to a Boy shame. Scouts copper drive. <laughs> I know that's <laughs> awful, but they—I didn't, mean—they didn't think, you know, uh, God forbid. 50 years from now when we're all dead, everyone's going to be like, oh my God, this 40 going on 14, it was so freaking groundbreaking for the time. We don't know what the hell we're doing. They were just making a movie. You know, it's, they weren't looking to make any sort of like groundbreaking. You never know when you're making history. Right. And they definitely made history. It's or a baby. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you should know. Yeah. <laughs> Cute. I, I don't know where to take this. <laughs> Not to Joel's house. <laughs> <laughs> Cherish the doo bow. Oh my god, I'm pregnant. <laughs> That's how it happens. It's just that so, easy. So we have the 1950s version of I gotta stream this, it'll be huge on YouTube. Is we'll be the first ones to do this. We'll totally be in the papers. Those guy, the, the three guys at the very beginning, the top yeah. truck guy and all that. Oh, I got a sugar shack or a sugar bag. You know, we'll wave that. and Because that's a universal symbol. I know. What if they're afraid of sugar? What if they don't like the color white or no. sugar? Yeah, sugar bags or. Yeah. They're diabetic. What if they're, what if they're yeah. bulls and they don't like things waved at them? Yeah. All that stuff going on. But then you get what zapped. If, what if they're going to shoot you and turn you into ash? Right. And that lays out there exactly in the shape of your body. 
That's how it works, right? Right. It was nice of him to leave a clue just like that. <laughs> Ooh, a raging clue. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. But when, the, when they're talking about the, oh, my God, they're attacking California, Bordeaux, Spain, Italy. Oh, my God, they're attacking the vineyards. <laughs> They really just want wine. Is this who is this a first wing for any of us? Yes. Yeah. No. Really? Oh yes. my god. That's insane. I I can't even I, I have seen this more times than I can count. Really? Oh yeah. You st- I know I, it was on a regular rotation on um uh Family Classics on Channel 9 in Chicagoland. I've only seen it like once or twice, so I'm not in the mic category, but yeah, I, I love, I love old sci-fi. So right in my wheelhouse. Yeah. I'm trying to remember. Yeah. I just had never gotten around to it. Huh? I feel like, I mean, when you have a great story um, to begin with, it's as long as you have all the right moving parts, you know, you can make something that's, that's good. And I think this one is above average for, well, especially for the time and the amount of kind of sci-fi stuff that was coming out. But uh, it had such a good base and they put a lot of, felt like they put a lot of time and energy into it that all things considered, I think it's it's a really solid, mm-hmm. solid take on the story. Well, and it mm-hmm. was a studio production. It wasn't like this little indie thing. This was like a big Paramount release. Oh, yeah. Cecil B. DeMille, you know? It's- yeah. So, do do any of you remember Family Classics with no. Fraser Thomas? Mm, not something I think I ever watched. Oh man, it was on for eleven years. It was on Chicago Channel Nine. Oh, I'm not from on, here. I, well, I mean, Saturday, Josh, maybe you know, <laughs> but uh, but I mean, it was on. Let's see, the earliest one they have, they did the Adventures of Tom Sawyer. The let's see. The newest one, Miracle on 34th Street, The Rocketeer. Mm, just talking about that. Yeah. The, those magnificent men in their flying machines. I think they did big also. But it was it was like every Saturday it would it would show up like after after cartoons, after um Soul Train and all that, and then that would be like afternoon. And that would have always have Fraser Thomas like opening a book that had the name of the movie on the front. So anyway, that sounds kind of familiar. Like I, I think I was aware it was a thing, but never watched it. Yeah, Fraser Thomas, the uh, the guy who hosts was the host for the Bozo Show for so long. Anyway, so first viewing, what's okay? What is your guys' take on it then? I mean, what? Uh, honestly, aside from it having kind of dated pacing, uh, th- there were some slow moments that were a little less exciting than I might prefer. Like, I thought the acting was good. The uh, interpretation of the story was good. Like, overall, like I really enjoyed this more than I thought I was going to. Like, I was not looking forward to this topic. Um, oh. But, no, this this worked. That makes me happy. My take was you? pretty similar to Josh's as far as like, I wasn't really looking forward to it. I'm, um, I don't really look forward to most of these, you know, movies that are made, you know, this late unless they're comedies. That's about the only, you know, sci-fi just never really does it for me when it's this old. And this was interesting enough. I mean, it was a little bit slow that, you know, that we didn't need, you know, three minutes of military footage. Every time we talked about the military, you know, there's a lot of B roll stuff. Um, <laughs> and, the special effects for the time were actually not that bad. You know, there were, there were a few moments I noticed some random whatevers, but other than that, it didn't like take me out of the movie too much. Do you know how they did the heat ray? I do not. They, when they would line up, I'm sorry, it's it's an old black and white movie. This is my thing again. <laughs> they used to line up propane torches behind this behind the the, the shots, so they would they would film a propane torch and then blow a fan behind that to make it go even further, film that and then overlay that onto it. Hmm. Yeah. 
And yeah, the domes, okay. oh. oh, I'm sorry. The domes are the same thing. They they just filmed a bunch of glass domes, regular size, like you'd put over a statue or that sort of thing. They filmed those for the scenes that they needed them on and then just overlaid them on top of the film. And apparently they had a prototype to have legs made of sparks for the uh, floating machines, but they, it, it was deemed a fire hazard and super dangerous, so they cut them. Which is funny because there was a lot of fire in this movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there was. I mean, you can see electricity coming from the bottom of the ships at times, but uh, this, I, I, one of the things I like about this movie and the story in general is that almost the entire thing is like, it's very, it's like you don't know if the, the humans are actually going to come back. Like the aliens are just like, consistently just beating them down and beating them down and just there's no hope and it's not until the last like five minutes that things finally turn around and it's kind of rare that either you know the bad guys win which happens sometimes or the good guys win and you can tell early on that they're going to win this one eh, they don't really let on too much that the good guys have a chance (laughs) so it's yeah and do the good guys win I mean uh, like humanity survives but it was just like a freak accident. Yes. And I think that's one of the things I like about it is that it, it felt, it feels different at the end of the film because you're right. Even though they won, they still lost with how many people were killed, um, which is something we'll get into a little more with the, the remake, but yeah. What was the cost? You see, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the ending. I don't, I mean, I, I get, you know what they're what what hg wells with everything was going for the whole story wise but like it just seems it seems almost cheap well and that's the thing is they like i want to talk a little bit about the hg wells story because uh, basically it was written with after seeing what the british empire and their pursuit of colonialism did to the tasmanians like they have this superior technology they come in and they fuck these guys up and H.G. Wells was like, well, what if people from another planet did this to us? And that was why when it came down to like the only thing that the overwhelmingly technological, uh, like advanced society, only thing that stopped them were diseases. Cause th- that was something that happened. Right. Yeah. So I thought that was an interesting take on it, especially considering like the first version of the story set in Victorian era London, as opposed to fifties uh, California. Well, and there, I, I, oh, good. I was going to say there is a TV series that has that set. I think that was two thousand and eleven that came out. That it's all set in Victorian London. No, that was two thousand nineteen. That was just recently. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Because I was anxious to see it, and I I never got around to it. I was hoping to watch it before the show, but. I mean, the the funny thing is, is that even though it's kind of an abrupt ending because uh, and I think that the series maybe would stretch it out and, and give you some more backstory to it. It's not out of the realm of the pos- uh, realm of possibility that something like that could happen. The the the, you know, dying from uh, an illness that they have no immune system for. It's 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 possibility. Yeah, I mean, it's more likely to happen to the conquered than the conquerors, but yeah, it's definitely a thing. Well, it doesn't make for a satisfactory ending to a dramatic story. It just, it's just, it's a, it's a very cheap uh, Deus Ex Machina device. Well, here's the thing: in the book, I, I, I look, I wrote down some of the the changes on there. So in the book the aliens actually give themselves transfusions of human blood, which then triggers off everything. So it's less of a, oh, they breathe the air and now they're, they're dying. It was a, you know, they got injected and got like earth aids or whatever from us, you know, stuff that we're already immune to that was already in our bloodstream. That's, that's what happened in the book. Um, they also had, they also saved humans to hunt down other survivors the, the tripods also had... Now, this isn't the, the new show also. They also, instead of having the... Um, what do they call them? The, the skull rays on the on the tips? You know how they, the, the ones on the tips of the uh, ships that would fire off? 
instead of having that, they had the black smoke and they would just like dispense black smoke all over an area and anybody who breathed it in would die. So there was a little more visceral in the books. But no, I mean, there's some of the, <laughs> some of the things that I, th- I thought were kind of interesting. Like when they're, um, what, what was it? When the one scene where he's, they're talking about the end of the world. Oh, it's the end of, they're in the ditch. Oh, it's the end of the world. And this, all this is going on, but you're looking pretty good. <laughs> you know, he had that kind of like, Hey, end of the world, but you're looking good, girl. What you a know? bone. <laughs> I know, right? And there is a little bit of like, uh. Uh, hysterical uh, woman goes hysterical. Uh, he doesn't actually slap her at any point, but it looks like he's about to a couple. I times. thought yeah. he was going to at one point. I, I was waiting for it. I thought it was coming. You know, there were a couple times she had a great reaction when the alien hand came over her shoulder. Yeah, right. <laughs> that, was, that was you know what the thing was. Though? I I I laugh every time I see that because it's almost close to like a um, Abbott Costello movie. Yeah, it's like it's like slapstick almost how she reacts to it. Yeah. Like her eyes thing... get so wide, it's almost like a like a joke. Yeah, the whole thing with that with that figure though is that that the model, the suit that they used for the alien was literally built the night before because they created, <laughs> the, yeah, they created one by the name of the guy who did the um, effect for that was uh, something Gam- Gamora, Gamora. Some, Gam- it's pronounced like that, Gamora, and him and his at the time. 12 or 14 year old daughter stayed up all night and remade the alien because the original one that they made George Powell was like that's way too freaking big we need it smaller and they're like all right we're filming tomorrow so they the daughter I watched an interview with her and she said you can see in some places where the uh, plaster that they used to put it together is starting to come off (laughs) because it's not totally dry yet and then they put him in the uh, the dad was in the suit. There's a couple scenes where you can see him climbing in, like putting the big dome over his head. They pulled him along on a dolly to make him move while the daughter was underneath with bellows, moving the bellows to make all the veins and everything pulse on the on the model. And then at the very end, did you notice when the when the when he throws the axe at the alien and the alien runs away and it almost does a kind of like whoop, 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 run? <laughs> yes. And kind of like where the feet go before the body does. That's because the stage hand pulled the rope too fast. And the guy in the suit, Gamora, and the, who was the guy in the suit, almost lost his balance and almost fell off the pallet that they were pulling. <laughs> but I, I love the stories of the old effects where they're just like, we don't know how to do this. Well, what if we just what if we just did it? You know, it's like they they have such a desire to make this effect work and while i'm not trying to discredit like the cgi artists of today what you're doing is more than i can do i respect that 100 percent. but staying up all night making a plaster of paris alien for this movie you know just to use it in one shot and they think they said it almost like fell apart right after they finished a the scene also so they're like well that's scene <laughs> you know it's like we're not but i mean getting a second chance there's some examples, though, and I feel like they held up pretty well. I mean, you look at like even like Frankenstein, Jack Hill's Frankenstein makeup holds up today just as well uh, as any other practical effects you might see in modern age. So um, I give him a lot of credit. I felt like for the time, especially they were above par for um, the the quality of, of what they were putting out there for above the, for the Jack time. Parr. <laughs> I don't know what Jack Parr has to do with anything. With I don't either. Right now either, but I don't either. So, all right. You think you're done with this or did you have any first time comments again? No, I think we, we covered like some of the trivia I dug up on it and uh, my thoughts. When the, when the one ship crashed into the house, I thought it was a pretty impressive effect I thought. except they ruined their breakfast <laughs> that is Bastard. one fried best fried breakfast too man those eggs were really cooked well uh that, one more thing about the the miniatures like the the towns there were minis for when they were flying the ships in but the ships themselves were about five feet across so the buildings that they did the minis in and that that house also See, the minis of the downtown L.A. that they put together were probably six, seven feet tall, depending on the the building. 
and the city hall building that they blew up at the end that they think they said it was like 12 or 13 feet tall. So they really put a, I mean, made up full intersections of downtown LA in 1953. Hmm. Yeah. But anyway, we no plan nine from outer space. Thank God. That's true. Yep. Oh, so anyway, we are going to take a little break and we come back. We're going to talk about Tom Cruise 2005's Plan 9 from World War Outer Space by Spielberg Stevens. Yes. Be back in a bit. I wonder and- what the difference between this and Plan 9 was. <laughs> talent? Talent? A couple hundred thousand dollars? I don't know. No. Could it be talent? Could it be skill? <laughs> Acting ability? They must have wanted it more on this skin, mm. on, on this stage. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Oop, he's getting rough with you. <laughs> I get rough with him. <laughs> All right, we are back. We're going to talk about 2005's War of the World. An alien invasion threatens the future of humanity. The catastrophic nightmare is depicted through the eyes of one American family, family fighting for survival. That was a lot more difficult than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> Welcome Direct- to my world. <laughs> Directed by a one, Steven Spielberg. This is like his first movie, I think, isn't it? As a director. Yeah, yeah, we do this joke every time. Yeah. <laughs> Still funny. Is it though? <laughs> that was funny. Uh, it's Russian written. <laughs> it's, it's Russian. Russian. <laughs> it's Russian by, of course, H.G. Wells, and then Josh Friedman, who also did Chain Reaction, Terminator Dark Fate, and as a writer on the Snowpiercer TV show. So, like sci-fi. Yeah. Chain Reaction was his first one. He's also done stuff with um, Lock and Key, the Sarah Connor Chronicles uh, Foundation, which is something I've wanted to watch. The other writer on this is David Cope, who was a writer for Jurassic Park, Stir of Echoes. I think it's an underrated Kevin Bacon flick. Agreed. Uh, Mission Impossible 1996 and Ghost Town. What was Ghost Town? The movie? Yeah. Oh, the Ricky Gervais one. Yeah. Oh, the series? The TV show? Oh, I thought there was the like movie. a movie in the 80s called Ghost Town. No, that's not it. Oh? Oh, I know what you're talking about now. Yeah. I, okay. I had to look it this up. This has Sorry. Tom Cruise as Ray Ferrier. You may know him from Top Gun. Everything else that Tom Cruise has done. Jerry Maguire, Mission Impossible, Last Samurai, Jack Reacher. Uh, risky business. Risk, yeah, risky business. Holy cow. Far and away. Far and away. Far and away. Vanilla, what? I'll say Vanilla Sky. Magnolia. Ah, I have one of his yeah. best roles. We also have We're Dakota Fanning. San Diego. <laughs> Dakota Fanning. Screaming a lot. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's her main role in this. From also Secret Life of, Life of Bees, I Am Sam, most recently uh, Ripley, the First Lady. She played Hillary Clinton in a show called Rodham, but I think that was the one that uh, Hulu was like, no thanks to. And for some reason, Miranda Otto. Yeah, that's a weird one, too. Right, I didn't understand her casting. Like, why did you need her in this role? Yeah, Miranda I mean, this Otto. was kind of before she was who she was. Yeah, that's true. Or who she is? Well, she was the Eo- in in two thousand two. Yeah, yeah, but uh, I remember thinking that the first time I saw this, I was like, "Why is she in this?" Yeah, probably to work with Spielberg. Yeah, to get that on your resume. That's I guess that's a good I guess thing. I, yeah. That's a valid reason. It tracks. 
So also we have Justin Chatwin as Robbie, who was known for playing Goku in Dragon Ball Evolution. Oh, he's, he's got actually a pretty good career, honestly. But you're going to pull that one. All right. I'm going to pull. Hey, that's the first one listed in his IMDb known for. Also, the invisible Nick Powell and Weeds. He was also in that. Uh, Smallville, he played Teen oh, Jostled he by Whitney. He was Josh Wilson in Weeds. Oh, okay. So, uh, Tim Robbins playing Tim Robbins. This is actually his whole scene was shot in his actually his apartment. <laughs> so Tim Robbins and he actually as, died in this. Yeah, like that's like why. he no in real life like they actually murdered he actually Tom Cruise actually murdered they, him. They had a CGI Susan Sarandon out of the background. <laughs> You boys with your shovels uh, played Harlan Ogilvy. Rick Gonzalez played Vincent. You're soaking in it. Ew. Uh, he was also in Old School. Yol Vasquez as Julio, who was school, yeah. in Russian Doll, played John Rice, and was in Severance, another show that we have talked about doing. Yes, it's on the short list. And then, ready for this, Anne Robinson and Jean Barry from the original War of the Worlds were the grandmother and grandfather standing in the doorway at the end of the movie. Bum, bum, bum. Oh, that's cool. Uh, yep. Good story. And if you keep a, a hot eye open, there is a young David Harbour working as a dock worker in this also. Oh. Yeah. I missed There's that. Some good stuff in there. Didn't so, know to look for that. Yeah, I had I had to rewind and find him. But once you know it's him, you definitely recognize him. Uh, so trivia tripod designed for the aliens is based on H.G. Wells original description from his book, including the heat rays at the ends of the arms. And the red weed is also from the novel as the as is the alien need for humans. Red weed thing was pretty gross. Pretty creepy. Yeah. 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 Uh, One scene shows Ray running out of the house to find Robbie while dozens of people are right outside his house photographing the lightning storm. To film the scene, producers hired people on the street to come to the street at the time of the shooting with a camera and film so they could get pictures of Tom Cruise for free. Well, that's clever. (laughs) That is clever. Right? And uh, due to Steven Spielberg's last-minute post-production work, he had to drop out of a scheduled appearance with Tom Cruise to promote the film on the Oprah Winfrey show. He should have been there to wrangle him in. This was during the actually the episode of Tom Cruise's couch jumping. I love her. I love her. I love her scene. So, huh. yeah. Would hope Spielberg would have been like, calm it down. Now, on that same note, Steven Spielberg said that after shooting, he would never make a film with Tom Cruise again because of the behavior he had on the set related with his involvement with Scientology. Huh. So, I suppose when Spielberg is like, use kooky. And I wrote E.T. You know, <laughs> I did E.T. I mean, that's a pretty big mark on your career. <laughs> when Spielberg says, I'm not going to work with you again. you got to be like a Tom Cruise level celebrity to survive that. Right. Seriously. Oh, also, um, the most Jersey guy in the world. <laughs> what is, what his name? Uh, no, no, no. What was his name? The, the the guy who was repairing the cars. Oh, the yeah. Beginning. Fuck, I can't remember the character's name right uh, now. Oh, hang on. Yeah, I don't. Manny, his name is literally Manny the Mechanic in this one. It was played by Lenny Venito. So I just, I just that whole scene. He probably Lenny, wasn't acting. <laughs> you know, no, he was just a mechanic. You're taking my car. You're killing me here. Manny, get in the car. Quit messing around. Yeah, so first viewing for any of us? Nope. Yep. Nope. Yep. Oh, wow. Well. Yeah. I've seen this several times. I own it, actually. Of course you do. I, I do. I saw this once before. Oh. Oh. Yeah, I have not. This is the first time I've ever seen this. So. I'm not kidding yeah. when I say I like this story. Yo. Well, 
To kick us off, I want to say that one of the reasons why I had not seen this is because when it comes to uh, disaster movies, there is a unofficial subgenre where you have a leading man, usually an A-list or B-list actor, uh, who is doing an escort quest in the middle of a disaster with an incredibly annoying group of people, usually his family. And this is one of those movies. Yes. Yeah, World War Z is just like that. Yep. World War Z is like that. Uh, San Andreas is like that. 2012 is like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, both uh, Volcano and uh, the other one with Pierce Brosnan. Dan- Dante's, Dante's Peak. Peak. Dante's Peak are like that. Poor grandma. Yeah, this, I am not a fan of, I'm a fan of War of the Worlds. I am not a fan of the, I'm not even a fan of escort quests in video games. God, I hate escort quests. But, you know, I knew what I was getting into with this. And uh, for that subgenre, which is one I don't like, I actually thought this was pretty all right. I mean, I feel like if you've got Steven Spielberg at the helm, and this is kind of, I think, another one of his passion projects, maybe kind of like uh, West Side Story. Um, he he builds attention appropriately, like Ben Jaws. Uh I mean, there's a couple things here and there that that are a little off, especially he could have speaking of wrangling people, Dakota Fanning could have been wrangled in a lot or they could have outlined some sort of character flaw that causes her to be so freaking off the rails. Both Uh, kids were awful. But yeah. And the other kid that keeps trying to get away. And I I know they established him as a bad dad, but still they well, they and they tried really hard at the beginning to make you not like him. I mean, they were they were basically just two MacGuffins instead of characters. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And there was not a single likable character uh, in this. No. Uh, but I mean, somehow, it, normally that would sink the movie for me, but like, I was pretty okay with it. I liked the stepfather. I mean, he seemed all right. I liked Amy Ryan, but she was he, in, only in it for like a hot minute. The stepfather seemed Wait. to have his shit together and he provided for the kids. He seemed okay. Yeah, he was all right. Wait, was Annie Ryan, was that Cheryl? Amy Ryan was his next door neighbor with the little kid. Oh, I okay. I realized yeah. that was her. Wow. Yeah. She's dressed down massively with the glasses yeah, on. I did, and, I did yeah. not realize that was her. Huh. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think I think the thing is that despite the characters, the the special effects are amazing. The, the like I said, the, the tension, the the music. Um, I think everything else around it is so well done that the characters are almost just like a, a plot device to just get you to enjoy what else is going on in the lot in some Correct, respects. Yeah. 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 The characters this, are not the point of this movie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's like you enjoy the soda. You don't appreciate the glass that's in, but <laughs> yeah. I don't know. That's the best I can come <laughs> up with. That. It's like, yeah, it's really good soda. I mean, Tom Cruise is just the, the vessel carrying the story. And they really threw down, uh, in this on the like the aliens are bad, but the people are almost worse. Oh yeah. And I well, appreciated that's that. I felt like they handled the, the kind of end of potential end of the world, uh, post-apocalyptic, whatever scenario pretty well. I mean, it's been done in similar ways in other films, but, um, I thought they went pretty realistic with it. And the aliens are legitimately pretty terrifying. Well, the opening gambit when they, they you know just start turning people into ash and their clothes start floating away—that's a really cool effect. Mm-hmm. Yes, I think it was like it was the the beams were so hot it automatically made everybody evaporate. Yeah, I mean they and show you, up all shut the, down all the, the moisture in your body into steam. Just, whoosh, just, oh, that's crazy! I mean they shut everything down like they take away all of your avenues of escape essentially, and are like, okay, yeah. see you later. So. Some things I have here. Okay, so for character development, I have written down everyone is an asshole. Yeah. Yep. Um, one question I have is how deep are these things buried? That's, oh. And that's that's my thing because I'm like, all right. Well, like we your digging. standard big city is like a three to five hundred feet, but you know, below street level, and there's still you know, you know, uh, infrastructure. Right. So I'd say probably a thousand feet. I, and my question is like, we how deep can like when they do the the uh, 
seismographs and they do the the cert looking underneath the ground with the sound waves and all that doesn't over how many years nothing like that ever showed up so they, things must be pretty friggin deep well i mean they were almost certainly dormant and like you say pretty deep yeah um one thing i got really uh, aggravated about is the lightning strikes in that intersection a dozen times all in one spot and the whole damn town comes out to take a look there's one lady in curlers that i don't I, uh, the behavior of some of the crowds sometimes really confused me because especially in Jersey where nobody really gives a damn, everybody's going to come out and look at this one spot in the center of the street. The cops are useless and they're not brushing anybody back from this, you know, what could potentially explode or whatever. I, there was a lot of behaviors in this that I really did not think jibed like the, yes, the whole scene with you, you guys have a car. We don't, we're going to take the car. Yeah. That was awful and terrible, but there's also moments where keep moving, keep moving. Oh wait, you need some expository conversation with me, the soldier that's trying to keep everybody right. moving. Oh, yeah, yeah. I did yeah. notice that one too. Yeah. 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 And it happens. The only person I'm going to stop and explain anything to, but everybody else keep moving. Right. Like on their, on when they're going on the way to the ferry where she, where he meets Cheryl, who we never see again. So I don't know what the whole deal with Cheryl was, why she was even in the movie. But they stop and have this kind of, oh, Cheryl, oh, I haven't, this is Cheryl, Cheryl, this is my daughter, this is, and everybody else is like front, trying to get on on the, the ferry. And the other side of it is with the ferry, one thing I found incredibly stupid is you're all trying to escape a alien invasion. Everybody knows this is happening. Why would you allow people to get on the ferry with their cars? Because did you notice that then when the ferry tipped over, there were people in the cars that were on the ferry? Maybe they weren't their cars. They were just getting in the cars. Yeah, I don't know. That's Or maybe they were the people that were supposed to move the cars because they did say that they're going to drive the cars off. Maybe. I don't know. There maybe, was just some... maybe all the shit hit all the fans. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and how every all single time, every time Tom Cruise needs the escape a city or escape an area there's always a perfect path no no wow. cars in his way now that was talked about when they were doing the um then the in the movie reviews i remember seeing that like well, when it's always left. helpful when you're trying to escape an apocalypse to have people you know block your extras for you right um the you guys kind of touched on it earlier but uh when you kind of realize or when you make the realization of what they're actually using the humans for after they've, you know, decimated part of the population. Uh, and I assume a control move um, that they're basically using us as, as fertilizer. I mean, that smell must be pretty awful after a while. It smells like you lost your car keys, but then uh, um, just that moment of realization when you walk outside and everything's just covered in blood and there's like, veins everywhere essentially that, that was pretty gross when they're like terraforming the earth yeah. using our blood i do have to say though that the blood harvesting method was completely inefficient yes i thought they were just grinding them up into you know like a, a human smoothie and then just spraying it everywhere but yeah. that whole vacuum thing yeah that didn't make sense to me oh i ran out gotta pull one out of the backpack pop it down suck it out play it you know that that yeah. was gotta capri sun this thing yeah, right. <laughs> I thought the, a- the it, anus it would be the equivalent of us like like using a Capri Sun and then just going out in the backyard, just <laughs> spraying the Capri Sun all over the grass. Got wa- to gotta water the garden. Got to get me a Capri Sun. I see. I thought the ship's anus would have been much more efficient. Like it sucks it up, you know, grinds it, and then spits it back out. Right. Right. And well, I'm, my question is, if they're going to terraform the whole Earth, why do they have anybody alive in these baskets anyway? Why aren't they just going you into the big be going hopper? straight into the blender? Yeah. Right. Yeah, throw them right into the wood chipper. See, but it's still, them. regardless, was still pretty. See, and we, we 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 could be great bureaucrats for these aliens. Let's get your efficiency numbers up. Come on. Yeah, let's. let's you could get be this killing us out. at a much greater rate. <laughs> uh, no, okay. whole, oh, oh go ahead, sorry. No. I was going to say the whole scene in the basement. He does such a good job of building tension, yeah. and then kind of releasing that pressure a little bit, and then putting it back on again. Um, mm-hmm. and then the whole sequence when it, where it leads up to what happens between him and, and Tim Robbins, you don't see anything, but it has just as much impact knowing what he had to do to save his, you know, save his kid. 
Yeah, but yeah. way to ruin the little girl's favorite song for her. Now she's never right. going to be able to sing it again. Eh. Speaking of the kids. Okay, so Robbie's an idiot. All the tanks, all the Humvees are driving up to the top of the hill where obviously on the other side, a massive firefight is going on. Robbie's like, I need to see this. And he runs up the hill. My question is, why the hell was everybody else running up the hill towards the fighting and not running away? Because people are stupid. Well, I think the assumption was was that they wanted to help in the fight, but I I don't know why they kept having him say, I need to see this. Because it seemed more like he wanted to join and he wanted to fight. Right. And so... For him yeah. to show up at the house at the end of the movie is the most incredible pile of bullshit that this Patrick? movie has to offer. Yeah, I, fu- I that's that's my least favorite part of the entire movie. I fucking hated that when I first saw this movie. Like, yeah, just, Patrick, there's, no, there's no way that that kid should have could have should have survived. Right. When we decided to do this show, Patrick side messaged me that same night, and he's like, <laughs> he said that exact thing that uh, that he hates that part. Yeah, I just and, I remember like being enraged when I saw this movie the first time. I'm like, what the fuck? Like, I mean, that exp- if they had any sort of explosion that may have had some other, I mean, that was like a life ending explosion on the other side of that hill. Exactly. Everybody no, died. Nobody survived that. No, Robbie didn't tuck and roll and get out and of it the ma- way. And it actually, it made such, it was such a good narrative scene for the drama for everything to like make him decide like which child am I going to save right now? And he had, he had his own little alien up. Sophie's choice. Yeah. And it was so good and it's so well done. And you just basically just stab that whole scene in the back by being, Oh, it doesn't matter. The, the other kids survived anyway. And Crap, Boston was in really, yeah. Boston was in really good shape. I'm going to say, but then again, who the hell wants Boston? Even the aliens were like, eh, like it's too confusing. The streets go everywhere. Oh, Frank, where are you? I don't know, man. There's, there's. I think I'm in a cul-de-sac. <laughs> We're going to go over here and attack this grid city. It's much easier to get around. <laughs> Bastin. Anyway. It, though, after they did put the uh, the red vines everywhere, it did look like a Tim Burton movie. <laughs> but no, I, I... I... Joel, I think you liked it. I love it. I liked movie. it, too. Yeah. Oh. And I, I mean, you know, spoiler alerts for the end, but I, I pretty much a thumbs up. The main thing that I hated about it was that, that Robbie just shows up at the end. It's like, that's so stupid. I mean, Such a can... crappy Hollywood, you know, let's write this ending. So people aren't sad. Considering some of the other sci-fi movies that came out at this time and even before or after it's, it's one of the better ones. I'm not going to say it's perfect by any stretch and I'm not going to say, you know, it's, they set the bar so high that it's going to be hard to match it. But I feel like it was one of the better ones that had for come the, out in that like 10 year period for the season. For sure. I mean, it's not horrible by any stretch. No, I mean, it wasn't. I mean, it wasn't bad. I mean, I, I just think that there were some weird holes that I, I had issues with like, okay, the birds are landing on the tripods. Now, why did the tripods drop the shields? If the aliens were getting sick, I don't open all the doors and windows in my house if I have a cold. But maybe the the shields were biological and not mechanical. But then you got to drop a hint of that somehow. Right. Yeah, for sure. Well, they said that they had been walking around in circles and they seemed confused and things. So I think that they were just too sick to maneuver them. And they were trying to keep moving forward and do the carry out the plot, the master plan. But. Because they were so ill, they just, you know, when you get sick, it's hard to to, to do things. It's hard to things. remember to turn your, turn your shields, shields on. on. Yeah. <laughs> your, your shields in your nail, you know? You're just not, not doing it. Yeah, I have Would a head guys... cold right now, and my shields are totally down. I know. <laughs> what do you think about the tra- rocket launcher? What? The, the train scene. That was cool. That was effective. I've seen, uh, they use that again in another... I think uh, Train to Busan, there might have been a, a shot like that. The train on fire. I think there was. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's super effective because, you know, you're sitting there and you're like, oh, there's a train coming. And you see it go by and you're like, holy shit, this world really is fucked. You know? Yeah. It's kind of terrifying. Fast moving uh, megaton thing just on fire full of people. Um, yeah. 
uh, what was it? I had a point. I forgot what it was. The aliens did look like they were the second cousins to Independence Day aliens. <laughs> yeah. Bit. Yeah, they, they did look like the smaller versions. It's like it's like the, the Independence Day. Frank, no, don't go out there, man. There's always something with that planet. We tried it a few years ago. It didn't work out for us. It's not going to come, you know, it's not going to work out well for you guys. Well, let's say, um, let's switch this around again. So let's say you had a different actor in the lead. Like, um, I'm trying to think who would have been popular in 2005. Um, let's say, let's say Brad, like McConaughey yep. or Brad Pitt as the lead. Uh, you had a different kids that were not annoying, that were more endearing and more like kind of have an arc where they go f- earlier from, you know, hating their dad to kind of trusting him at least to loving him maybe a little bit more later. Would it have improved it for you? I A little bit. Yeah, because I think first off, I don't think Tom Cruise does blue collar real well. That's fair. Oh, you know who would have been good? Christian Bale. Christian Clive Bale's Owen. Coming. Clive Owen. Clive, yeah, Clive Owen. I could see Clive Owen, too. And I was thinking, well, uh, nowadays, if they did it again with the same story, uh, you know, Chris Pratt or somebody like that, uh, they'd probably use The Rock and they'd have it directed by Roland Emmerich and it would bomb. But <laughs> Well, I mean, The yeah. Rock did this sort of movie. It was called San Andreas. Yep. Are there aliens yeah. in that, though? I haven't seen no. it. But it's no. War, War of the Worlds with a Z. And a no, y. but it's what? Right, this is almost more uh, disaster movie than sci-fi. It's a disaster film w- with sci-fi elements. Uh, yeah, I'll buy it. Or instead of Mother Nature, it's Mother Kragnar. Well, I mean, if you look at zombie films, zombie films are essentially disaster films. This is similar to one of the, more similar to one of those. I would say. I, I I would agree with that, and I I like these types of movies. Any any sort of kind of end of the world scenario, whether it's you know horror based or a sci fi based, or even even sometimes the the natural disaster ones, because it feels like it's something that could maybe happen. Uh, so it's kind of scary still. Nice. Well, what do you think? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Yeah. Cool. I mean, I, I don't, can't think if there was anything else we, we talked about. I, I think all the major stuff. I mean, the, I will say the opening scene, pretty on the nose there, Steve. Start with looking at, you know, going to open the movie with, um, uh, what's his face? Morgan Freeman and pictures of Paramecium. <laughs> little yeah. germs and shit, you know. There was uh, the nice homage to the uh, chopping off uh, the snake with the axe. Yeah. Like they, they foreshadow it with like, okay, this is a bad idea. If you start doing this, they'll know where we are. And then he kind of has to. Very mm-hmm. similar situation. So, Patrick, thumbs up, thumbs down. Uh, I would say... Thumbs up for both. Good. Yeah, not like a, a you know crazy enthusiastic for either one, but yeah, thumbs up for both. Nice. I'm exactly there. I was like really not looking forward to doing this topic this week, and uh, I enjoyed myself a lot more than I thought I would. Yay. Joel, what about you, man? Uh, well, you and I are in the same boat. I love... Uh, old school sci-fi and I uh, obviously love the new one so I'm thumbs up on both it's a great story yeah I'm thumbs up on both also obviously so uh, huh. I wondered if there you, you thumbs down the new one no I enjoyed it I mean I, there were some plot holes but every movie has some sort of plot holes not, not every plot's going to be super sealed up I did have a couple you know like I, I do want to know uh, what the hell happened with Cheryl you know, like the whole, I think the whole Cheryl scene, because it never went anywhere. It was, why do we have that? I think and ha- it's a little more like just of, of like, you know, slice of life realism. You know, hey, maybe he is going to run into somebody at some point that he just knows from work or from whatever. But it doesn't really matter. You don't need an explanation for her. I don't know. Maybe. I, don't, I mean, I don't necessarily think it needs to be in the movie, but I don't necessarily think it takes away either. Just... Well, I mean, he otherwise has no sort of personal tragedy. There's no face on the tragedy because all of his kids live. 
and his yeah. ex-wife doesn't die. Nobody he cares about except Cheryl actually dies in this. So I think that's probably where they were going with it. You know, I wonder if that was like Cheryl was inserted after they te- maybe tested it out and didn't have or, the son live. Or it could be the other thing. Oh, you know, yeah, that they, they could have just substituted her for the whatever, you know. But yeah, like or it could be something showed... like there was a scene that explained who she was that was deleted. Right. It could you have know, been like a scene where he's listening to his answering machine and it's like, hey, this is Cheryl. You know, I can't make our date tonight or something. Yeah, maybe. And how did Robbie survive? Could we have gotten that scene? <sighs> you know what? Well, even gotten, no, he just didn't run away like an idiot. How about that scene? You stay and you help you know, protect your little sister. How about let's have that scene? I want to yeah. see. I wanted to slap the shit out of both those kids at various points in this movie. Yeah. Robbie was a shithead. <laughs> and I was kind of glad song. he was gone, and then he came back. And, and I was oh, very you've been running around, man! I, you were in the basement with that creepy dude, man! I, I, I survived that explosion and found mom right away. Yeah, you should have come with me. I left you guys to fend for yourselves because I'm a shithead. All right. Well, if you have your thoughts <laughs> about uh, classic sci-fi, or in general, or a way of uh, way of the worlds, War of the Worlds in particular, uh, let us know. Give us a call at seven zero eight now. Wrap that seven zero eight six six nine nine seven two seven. Yep. And you can find our older shows on uh, your favorite podcast apps, such as Podbean or Pandora. We're also on Apple, Google, and Amazon. And uh, do us a favor if you have a show that you like, share it with somebody. Throw it on social media. Let somebody else see it. Let's spread the love. Like lukewarm mayonnaise. Ew. Cherish the love we Ooh. Have. Sing us no. out, Joel. <laughs> what? Sing no. us out, Joel. No. So you've been coming up <laughs> soon. <laughs> We're gonna be talking about the Manchurian candidates. Father of the bride, house party, pajama jammy jam. And uh, maybe a little day there should still sometime in the near future. I want you to sing us on your tone, you know, jerk. Cherish the That's what I need. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. That's what I need. All right, everybody. Thank you for listening, and we will be back next week. Messina and Oates, live on Ah, g- 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 whoa.